The People's Republic of Congo is a country that should be extremely wealthy. They have enormous resources of minerals, of timber, and particularly of oil. And it's also run by a crime family, the Sasso and Gesso family, which has controlled the country for many, many years and made sure that as little as possible of the revenue of the country gets down to the people of Congo. So when Congo decided to default on its debt, we looked at that and we said, well, this is a country that has plenty of money to pay what it owes to international lenders. So we bought it. And then we approach them. This is the typical process. You don't rush into court. You approach the debtor and you say, you owe this money. We think you can afford to pay it back. Can we have a conversation about the terms on which you might be able to do that? You might be willing to do that. And they call you right back and they say, sure, well, who do we make the check out to? And it's, <laughs> and it's a really easy process, right? <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger, coming to you live from Atlanta, Georgia, in the world headquarters of the Crazy Money podcast, where we explore the connection between money, happiness, work, and meaning through the lens of my guests' expertise and or money journeys. And today, I've got a guy with incredible expertise and a money journey like you wouldn't believe. His name is Jay Newman. He spent 40 years in the hedge fund business, and after achieving incredible success in that field, he has just published his debut novel. That's right. Hedge funder with a heart and a soul becomes novelist. The novel is called Under Money, and The New Yorker describes Jay and the book thusly. The sovereign debt investor best known for a 15-year legal fight with Argentina, we'll get to that, channeled Tom Wolfe and John le Carre to write Under Money, a financial thriller featuring Vladimir Putin a Paul Singer-esque hedge fund manager, and of course, sex. I read it. There's a bit of it in there, I must, must confess. It combines espionage, financial intrigue, and geopolitics with the cynicism developed through years of observing politicians and Wall Street titans up close. It is unexpectedly timely. Close quote. And indeed it is with the plot lines featuring Russian oligarchs, kleptocracy at a sovereign level, and private Russian militias it is very timely, and coincidentally, it was written long before this whole thing with Ukraine hit the wires. Jay's got a really interesting backstory that informs where the novel comes from, and that's what the Argentina reference in the New Yorker's review points to. Jay made his name in the hedge fund business by pursuing unique transactions, where countries like the Congo, Panama, and Argentina would issue billions of dollars worth of bonds with the obligation to pay them back and then not pay it back for years at a time, Jay would go and acquire the rights to be paid back that debt and then engage the regimes that ran those countries in legal battles so that they would get paid back. Now, these transactions raise very important practical, logistical, and ethical questions that Jay and I discuss in this conversation. Hedge funds, they sound scary, and in some cases, they may be but in many cases, the people who have an interest in hedge funders are regular people like you and me. You or your grandma might have an interest in a hedge fund's performance, while the governments that ran these countries were hardly holding a higher ethical hand. It's hard to decide who's David and who's Goliath in these things, but the story sure is interesting. And I know that you are going to find Jay's personal journey and his business experience highly, highly interesting. This, my friends, is Jay Newman. Jay Newman, welcome to Crazy Money. Paul, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Jay, what is a hedge fund and how did you get into the hedge fund business? Long story. Hedge fund originated in the 1960s with the idea that you could invest in equities and hedge out the broader macro risks and create a better rate of return. As it's transpired, hedge fund is a meaningless term, or if it means anything, it just means that it's an unconstrained pool of capital. People who run hedge funds can really, they've got your money and they can do whatever they want with it. And as long as they make you money, which they don't always do. But that's how I would define it today. Unconstrained pool of capital. And a hedge just means you can make a counter bet to uh, soften your downside on certain positions. Is that correct? Yes, that's the theory. Uh, some people do it well. <laughs> <laughs> Some people don't do it at all. Many are just playing long or only find out they're long when their hedges don't work. But yes, you've got that right. Did you have a specialty in the hedge fund world? My specialty was chasing deadbeat countries. <laughs> Including the United States? Was the U.S. on that list of deadbeat countries? 
Not yet. Not yet. One can dream. Actually, the U.S. is a very tough target because there are all sorts of tools to uh, protect the U.S. government from people who wanted to do what they wanted to do. But no, not the U.S., but Latin America, Asia, Eastern Europe, Africa, all over the world. So when you say deadbeat, like, okay, so let's say I go out and buy a TV and you know, a VCR or something more, the, the modern equivalent thereof at the Best Buy, and I finance that on my credit card and I decide not to pay it back, somebody out there can buy that debt and try to collect it from me. Is that kind of what you were doing? Yes. And then we would refer to you as a deadbeat. <laughs> so talk about the way countries borrow money and how hedge funds play in the aftermarket for that debt. It's a complicated world of sovereign borrowing that uh, was made possible with some legislation that passed in the 1970s that enabled countries to waive their sovereign immunity. Historically, countries can do what they want. They're sovereigns. And they had what was known as absolute immunity. So you couldn't really chase them into court and expect to get a judgment against them, uh, much less to collect it. But in the 1970s, and this was really something that was promoted by Walter Riston and Citibank at the time, they passed a bit of legislation called the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, which enabled sovereigns to waive their immunity and agree to be sued in New York. The UK did the same thing. So you could be sued in New York or in London, and then you could proceed to collect against the country that borrowed money. But until then, it was very, very difficult for sovereign nations to borrow. And for very good reason, because most of the borrowing they wanted to incur would have been incurred in a currency other than their own. I'll give an example. So, Paul, to use your point about, you know, buying a TV at Best Buy, well, you're agreeing to pay for that TV in dollars. What if you agree to pay for it in Chinese currency or Russian rubles? And all of a sudden you found you were unable to get the Chinese currency or the Russian rubles. You'd run into trouble and you might, you know, really not be able to pay at all. And that's what happens with sovereign borrowing. Most of the borrowing we were talking about and the people that I was chasing were countries that would borrow not in the peso or in the zloty or the ruble, but borrow in dollars. And as a country, when you borrow in someone else's currency, it can be very, very difficult to get that currency when you need it to pay back what you owe. And who are the creditors on the other sides of these deals? Who's loaning Argentina and other sovereign nations tens of billions of dollars at a time? So this is the kind of the dirty secret of this uh, whole process, because there's a whole industry that involves bankers and lawyers and uh, trust officers that structure these loans to sovereigns. But the people ultimately, initially, who are lending the money are small investors because the, the funds that own the sovereign debt are run by Fidelity and by um, Schwab and other big asset managers. And you know how when you, you see in the paper, they advertise the performance of their funds, Fidelity, Prudential, whoever, they've got a hundred funds and they're always advertising the ones that did the best in the preceding three or four years. Sure. You know, at a given moment when emerging market funds look good, people buy them and they buy them in their pension funds. They buy them in their in their IRAs. They buy them personally, not really knowing what they what they own, because, you know, you can't if you're an individual investor investing in sovereign debt, you can't really know what you're doing. But when the country's default, those funds sell the debt. So if the fund owns Argentine debt and Peruvian debt and Polish debt and Ukrainian debt, if one of those defaults, the fund can no longer hold it. So they sell it out. And when they sell it out, they sell it out typically to a hedge fund. And they often, you know, when I was doing this full time, they would sell it out to me. And then the hedge fund takes over the process of actually going to court and trying to collect on the debt. Now, when I get money for my mortgage, I put my house up as collateral for the debt. What does a country put up as collateral for their debt? Just their word, their bond? Their word and their bond. And uh, it depends what that is worth. Ultimately, uh, many countries, uh, most countries have not defaulted on their debt and they pay what they owe, even if they have to sometimes restructure the, uh, the terms of the bond. They do honor that process. Some are recidivists and from the get-go have no intention of paying what they owe. Walk us through the kind of typical deal you might do over the course of the years, and then let's talk about the deal you're most known for, which is the deal with the Argentina debt. We'll save Argentina, uh, but let me start with a simpler case. Sure. The People's Republic of Congo, which is a country on the west coast of Africa. It's a country that should be extremely wealthy. 
They have enormous resources of minerals, of timber, and particularly of oil. And it's also run by a uh, crime family, the Sasso and Gesso family, which has controlled the country for many, many years and made sure that as little as possible of the revenue of the country gets down to the people of Congo. So it's a, it's a very corrupt place. So when, when Congo decided to default on its debt, we looked at that and we said, well, this doesn't make any sense. This is a country that has plenty of money, not just for its own purposes, but to pay what it owes to international lenders. And so we bought it. And then we approached them. This is the typical process. You don't rush into court. You approach the debtor and you say, well, Mr. Debtor, uh, in this case, uh, President Sasu and Gesso, you owe this money. We think you can afford to pay it back. Can we have a conversation about the terms on which you might be able to do that? You might be willing to do that. And they call you right back and they say, sure, well, who do we make the check out to? And it's, <laughs> and it's a really easy process, right? <laughs> and come over and vacation on our lovely beaches while you're at it. They do say that. And the affair of the beach is something you, you actually, I'm sure that was intentional. The affair of the beach in Congo was a, a sort of affair in which um, Sasso Yeso lined up his enemies and gunned them down right on the beach, uh, you know, in West Africa. So they did not call us back. We tried again. We tried many times. And uh, in the end, we had to take them to court and we took them to court. In, what court? In, Whose jurisdiction is this? Because the contract provided for it, you could take them to court in London or in New York. And we did both. And we focused on their oil revenues. Uh, and because oil revenue, oil, uh, as we're learning with this, uh, you know, the process with Russia, oil, you know, seeks its own level. It's always flowing. And we are able to actually uh, attach a cargo and end up in court with the oil minister in London. So you can seize their assets or, or their diplomat? Why do they care? They could just be saying, well, we're Congo, screw you. Is it because they can't get more credit in the future that battling them in court matters? All of the above. So the first thing they say is, of course, screw you, we're not going to pay you. And you try to find their assets. It's very, very difficult to enforce sovereign claims with assets. It's hard to find their assets. And the, the whole legal process is conspires against the creditor. But having said that, your point about access to capital markets is critical. That's really, really what countries want. They don't like to be have be in default indefinitely because then they can't go back to the well and borrow more money and in most cases steal it. That is the context. You've already mentioned going to court, doing a lot of research. Trying to collect on sovereign debt is a highly expensive process, it sounds like. You've got to have deep pockets to have any chance of defeating a sovereign nation at this game. And this is why it's really not a, a prudent asset for uh, retail investors. <laughs> you don't want to have that next to my, my typical IRA and you know small cap domestic stocks. You'll, you'll be surprised. Your international bond fund have, probably has debt of, of many countries that are going to default in the next 18 months. There are a few things that are important if you're investing in defaulted sovereign debt. First of all, you have to buy it at a, an appropriate price, by which I mean a very low price. because Pennies on the dollar. Yes, pennies on the dollar, because if you overpay for it and it takes you a lot longer to negotiate a resolution, your rate of return is going to be very bad, or maybe you're going to lose money. So you have to buy it very well. You have to have staying power. Staying power means you can hold it for a long time if you need to. And you also have the, the wherewithal, the financial resources to go to court, to hire investigators, to go through a very elaborate and expensive process of enforcing these claims. To the tune of tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Yes. And that's another point. You really have to have the right scale to make this work. So if you will, walk us through what the opportunity was with Argentina debt and what year was this and the then pervading political situation in the world and in Argentina specifically. It's been so many years. The uh, Argentine... Broad strokes are fine. Yeah, yeah. Argentina's default extended from 1999 to uh, 2016. So it went on for the better part of 17 years. My involvement lasted more or less 15 years. Not all of that, you know, in court, but, you know, at many points along the way, trying to, you know, get the attention of the Argentine government and get them to the table to negotiate. The thing about Argentina that's very unusual is, and Argentina is a spectacular country, spectacular people. Uh, I encourage everyone listening to this to make an effort to visit. And January and February and March are the perfect time. But 
The thing about Argentina is they have a very bad attitude toward their external obligations. So they've defaulted now eight separate times. I think they've now rivaled Greece. Greece used to have the title of uh, of debt <laughs> defaulter. Congratulations, uh, but- Argentina. You've... <laughs> You've outlasted the Greeks. Yay team, right? So Argentina defaulted in 1999, and um, I was fortunate enough to be, be able to you know, participate in that for many years, to be able to buy the debt at very good prices, and to pursue the claims um, initially through conversation and efforts to negotiate. But Argentina was run for most of that time by um, the Kirchners, uh, you know, husband and wife. They felt that their populist message was best promoted by uh, stiffing the Yankee gringo. In fact, they referred to us as as vultures. They had a famous slogan, I've got a poster inside, Basta Buitres, which is enough of vultures. And that lasted until a new administration came in. Mauricio Macri ousted the Kirchners very briefly because he's now gone, but she's you know a member of the Senate. Uh, she's back in control. So there was a, an interregnum there when a new administration wanted to get back to capital markets, wanted to repair the image of Argentina with the international community. And that's the period in which the debt default was settled. When you're making a bet like this, you're betting on thousands of variables, including the actions of governments worldwide. And so, for example, like in the spring of 2020, as COVID is being recognized as a real thing, markets in the U.S. just start to plummet, right? And so my friends who had been short waiting for this correction all this time are like, we're finally going to make a bunch of money on this long-term bet. And then what does the government do? It just throws a bunch of money into the system. The market recovers and even goes up. So they lose money. How do you, when you're taking this position on a macro geopolitical kind of equity, how do you factor in all those things that you're not in control of? What might happen? What might not happen? There are really two factors with sovereign debt. One is the fundamental capacity of it. it it's true of any any debt claim, any mortgage, any bond, you know, any loan. You're always assessing the ability, the ultimate capacity of the debtor to repay what it borrows. Uh, and it's the same with sovereign debt. The, with sovereign debt that's in default, you have another variable, which is actually helpful to uh, hedge fund investors, which is if the debt is trading at a big discount and you're buying it at pennies on the dollar, you have a lot more flexibility. You don't you don't have to insist upon payment uh, of 100 cents on the dollar. You would like to get paid 100 cents on the dollar, but you don't have to in order to make money. So it's a, it's a very different dynamic. So along those lines, at some point, 93% of the other bondholders had accepted new bonds worth 30 cents on the dollar, but you decided to hold out. Did you have a number in mind as to what an acceptable profit on this deal would be? Well, we had a number on mind in mind as to what wasn't acceptable. And what wasn't acceptable was Argentina refusing to negotiate in good faith and refusing to pay what it was able to pay and essentially gaming the international system uh, and taking advantage of creditors who, you know, didn't have the stamina to, uh, you know, because face it, I mean, if you're dealing with a sovereign and all they have to do is write a check to lawyers uh, to fight you in court, they're going to do that for the most part. And that's that's true of every sovereign, even and especially the U.S. I mean, it's uh, the dogs of law are always out there and they're working hard uh, to do the bidding of their sovereign clients. Your involvement in this trade has been described as a Captain Ahab, Moby Dick quality. What kind of toll did this take on you personally? Hmm. At times it was a bit debilitating. Uh, it just went on for a very long time. And when a sovereign is calling you names, and even more importantly, when your own government is filing, you're in court and your own government is filing briefs in the court, asking the court to ignore your claim and to side with you know, a country like Argentina, which made a practice of not paying what it owed, at times it got a little depressing, but you, know, you, can't be, you can't be in the investment business and especially in the hedge fund business if you don't develop a thick skin. I've got plenty of scars, plenty of calluses, and ultimately it worked out. Now, a lot of people would say that what you did was unethical, that you're betting against a poor country, you're taking advantage of these poor citizens of Argentina, that you're just a greedy hedge fund guy. What's the ethical justification on both sides of this trade? From the hedge fund side, from our side, you have to think about who the investors are in hedge funds. And those investors are some individuals 
but mostly institutions. So the university endowments, you have pension funds, you have sovereign wealth funds. So the investors, and ultimately that trickles down, you know, in fact, it flows down very directly to individuals who benefit. So if you're a retired policeman and your pension fund is invested in a hedge fund, you are indirectly invested in everything the hedge fund invests in, including if the hedge fund owns it, Argentina or Peruvian debt or Congolese debt or whatever. So the equities are not as simple as the, the sovereign would like to make out. I would say that the, uh, the PR teams on both sides worked overtime to make this understood and to, but you know, there's a, there's a natural sympathy if you think about the people of a poor country and the PR people know how to play upon that. But the, the reality is that my reality, you know, everyone has perhaps a different reality. My reality is that the debtors that don't want to pay what they owe are typically corrupt. And the money that they save by not paying what they owe is never going to actually trickle down to the man on the street. It's going to be retained by local elites uh, and ultimately stolen. So I think the equities are a little complicated here. It's certainly not black and white. But from our Western perspective, representing uh, university endowments and pension funds, as most hedge funds do, uh, we think that's the right thing to do. Did you ever fear for your safety while this was going on? I only felt fear for my safety once in the final days of negotiating a deal with the Republic of Panama. The head of their national security administration was across the table. And he leaned over as he was about to sign the agreement, pen in hand, and he looked me in the eye and said, it would be a great pleasure if you would visit me in Panama. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Noriega. I appreciate it. <laughs> not, going, not going there. Panama is beautiful. My family and I went there a few years ago. It was a wonderful visit. We had a great time. It is another great place to visit. I will have to pass on that. But, uh, <laughs> But everyone else should go. There are other tropical countries where you'd feel uh, more at home, I suppose. Yes. If you hadn't done that deal, what would have happened to Argentina's debt? And do you think the country would be better or worse off in the time since? Either some other investors might have pursued the claim in the same way. That's possible. People might have settled their claims at larger or smaller discounts. But that debt default would have been resolved and it was resolved. But having said that, Argentina defaulted again two years ago. So they solved that issue in 2016. And then in 2019, 2020, they defaulted again. So the debt that they issued to restructure the bonds that, that we held was replaced by new debt. And Argentina didn't pay that and negotiated another, we call it a haircut, a discount of 50%. And my guess is they're going to default upon that. So it's just for Argentina, it's, it's a process of whittling down you know, what they owe. And having said that, that's not good for Argentina because Argentina, the capital markets know, know that cat and they know that they don't want to be investing in those bonds. And the rate of borrowing has to, the cost of borrowing has to go up because they're likely not to pay everything back, right? I mean, that's not good for the Argentine people. It's not good and it keeps rates high and it keeps the popular story flowing, but it's really not good for the country ultimately. So you spent 40 years in the investment game. How did you decide it was time to transition to doing new work or a combination of uh, investing in writing? Well, 40 years was a, you know, a good stretch. I didn't see any other investments like Argentina on the horizon. Others have since you know, come up over the horizon. But at that point, it seemed like a very good time to transition and uh, take a breather, which is what I've been doing. And one thing I wanted, I always wanted to do was to write. I didn't know what I would write, but I figured I would try my hand at that. What was it in you that made you want to write? Were you a big fan of uh, literature or novels? I've always been a reader. I've always been a, a writer. I've written op-eds over the years. I actually have uh, a notebook I found recently from college where I had notes on uh, different characters and plot ideas none of which I did anything with. I want to know, what was this about? You were at Yale in what, the early 80s or late 70s? What were the ideas that you had back then? Well, it was, uh, I was going to write about a, and I still have this idea. I'll wait until I finish the Under Money series. But the idea is a, a class, it's sort of, um, I don't know if you remember this show, uh, you know, The Millionaire, and this guy would give money. He would find somebody and he would give them a million dollars. Mm-hmm and then watch what happened with it. So I had this idea for a, uh, a professor who um, 
taught a class and he decided to give each of his, his students a million dollars and to watch what they would do with it over a period of time. So it was basically centered on, you know, write what you know or think you know. So I was a kid, I was writing about other kids, but that's the book that never got off the ground. My still. What was your family like? Did you come from a family with uh, resources or were you more of a working class kid? More working class. My mom was a uh, teacher, uh, an art teacher. My dad had retail stores, went to public schools all the way uh, until college. But one thing that my parents valued, and my mother was kind of a little crazy this way, she had the travel book and she always wanted to travel. So every summer we would travel. And one of those most memorable trips that we took was a drive. My mom had read about the Pan American Highway. This was in the 60s. And you were supposed to be able to drive from New Jersey, which is where we were living, all the way to Panama. Think about the 1960s. This was a really a wild, it's a wild idea. It's an even more wild idea today because you wouldn't survive driving through Mexico, much less down through uh, Honduras and Guatemala and Nicaragua and to all the way, which we did. So my mom put us in a car. My dad got in with us. We drove all the way to um, Managua, Nicaragua from New Jersey. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. It was literally crazy. And my dad was the same one because he, he decided he had to go back to work. So he flew back from Mexico City. So this American woman with flaming red hair was driving from Mexico City to Managua, Nicaragua with two pubescent kids, two boys in the back seat. And along the way, and, and we were stopped many times because there are lots of guerrilla wars. In Guatemala, we were stopped by kids with guns, sometimes representing the government, sometimes representing, you know, terrorists or insurgents. And it was like that all the way, all the way down. So Jay, you've obviously had a lot of exposure to international adventures prior to becoming an adult. Did writing this novel come from your fascination with the way the world works, the way money and and political interests intertwine in today's world? It was seminal. One of the great luxuries I had in my business career was being able to travel the world. And I've been to, I don't know, 60, 70 countries looking for investments and when you're looking for an investment in a country, you're always trying to figure out who's doing what to whom. Uh, and <laughs> it's challenging. It's challenging anywhere. It's particularly challenging, you know, in the United States, but it's the United States is, is just, you know, an exemplar for, for every other country. You have business interests, you have political interests, you have uh, cops, you have crooks. And the trick in making uh, smart investments is to make sure you're not the guy that's getting stung. And, what it led me to understand was the, the dark underbelly of money and power and the relationship between money and power. So when I retired from hedge fund work, I thought about writing that from a nonfiction perspective, but I rapidly realized that nobody would read it and I probably couldn't tell the whole story. So writing fiction made much more sense to me because I could, I could try to you know, draw some broader themes out and bring in elements of many of the people that I had met over uh, over 40 years. So that's where I got the idea of writing fiction. It was really to draw on my experience, but in a way that might communicate, you know, and deal with broader themes. What's the elevator pitch for the book? A team of American patriots decide that they don't like the way the world is being run. They don't like the way that the U.S. is being run. And they decide that the way to um, do something for their country is to get one of their cohort elected to higher office, in this case, the presidency. But they know they need money. So they steal it. But then they find out the stealing it isn't enough. They've got to find a way to funnel it back into the political system. And they take over uh, a hedge fund that turns out to be the most corrupt hedge fund on the planet. And it's corrupt in ways that this guy, the Vickers, the lead evil hedge fund guy, makes huge bets, makes short calls on companies that then, oh, accidentally have major disasters happen to them and the stock plunges, and he makes billions in profits. Now, how close to reality is this in terms of, we see lots of kleptocracy in the world, we see governments moving billions around, we know there's, you know, who knows how much dark money out there, but are there really hedge fund guys engineering humanitarian disasters from which they profit? No. (laughs) (laughs) It's an intriguing idea. There are not, but you know, maybe I'm going to, I'm going to qualify that. I think in the, in the Western world, in the U S there are no hedge fund guys that are engineering disasters. Like, you know, one of the characters in under money is engineering disasters. 
But, and this is an example that, that I use in the book. If you think back a couple of years to when the Saudis and the, the Russians, as members of OPEC, were doing a, you know, a pantomime over, are we going to cut oil production? Are we going to increase oil production and making threats to each other? And all the while, the price of oil is going up and down, moving violently in either direction. If you were to know what the Saudis and the Russians were going to say and what they were going to do, you would be able to trade on that information and make a, a vast fortune. And I read about this because I believe I am morally certain that both the Saudis and the Russians were doing just that, that they were trading on their own behavior. And if you think about what's going on in, in the world today, there's really no, there is an article in the paper about a wheat, the so-called wheat whale, somebody controlling the market for wheat and driving the price up. So if you knew what was going to happen in the Ukraine and in Russia, and you had a view on wheat prices, you could profit from that. You could profit from nickel, from palladium. There's a, a vast opportunity, if you know what's going to happen in financial or commodity markets, to profit from it. And I believe very strongly, and this is why I, the structure of the book revolves around this, that that's exactly what's happening. And I like to say that if you, if you read something in the paper about finance or markets, and you see something you don't understand, the answer is usually under money. Mm. It's money that's flowing uh, and influencing people and events. You can't see it, but you know it's there. So instead of writing a nonfiction book that tells all the way, the technical ways that money and governments and private organizations have relationships that are not public, you decided to show them through the dramatization of a novel that there is this connection that most people don't know about. Is that basically true? Yes. And taking it a, a step further, it's money and power and the power is political power. So it was very important to me to introduce uh, some of the themes that I observed over the years. And this, I think, comes back to the divisiveness that we experience in this country, you know, with the two-party system and with members of both teams, the red team and the blue team, you know, pretending to fight all the time and fighting all the time. And, and at every step of the way, extracting money from people who want to influence them and then, you know, doing favors or not doing favors, describing how difficult it is to do a favor. But if they got a little more money, maybe they could do that favor next cycle. And so it was very important for me to draw that linkage between money and power and political power and military power as well. So because mm -hmm. all, all those elements, all those institutions are controlled in ways that are really not visible to the naked eye. And most people don't see and don't think about. So along those lines, I was watching Wall Street for the 137th time this weekend, and there's this line where Gordon Gecko tells Bud Fox, I'll read it, the public's out there throwing darts at a board sport. I don't throw darts at a board. I bet on sure things. Wonder why fund managers can't beat the S&P 500? Because they're sheep and sheep get slaughtered. So is everyone except the hedge fund world and the insiders that you describe in your book a sucker? I mean, Am I a mere millionaire hoping for 6 to 8% return? Am I what Hannibal Lecter would describe as a well-scrubbed rube? No, no. You could say yes. I'm not going to say that, but it's a matter of what you choose to invest in. I think that, you know, we've got a fantastic system on many levels. And if you're betting on the broader, and because investing is on some level betting, if you're betting on the broader market, over time, uh, you know, people have done well and will continue to do well in the West, in the US, in Europe. If you're talking about much more sophisticated investments and rifle shots, hedge funds have an extraordinary ability. They're run by really, really smart people and they're able to do the research that enables them to get an edge. Uh, so I think there is a big difference between the professional investor and the amateur investor. And that's why the big theorists about this say this all the time, that for the amateur investor, it's safest to be diversified and to invest for the long term. I wouldn't encourage anybody uh, on this call to invest in defaulted sovereign debt. You know, that would be something that would and should keep them up at night. But you dramatize it because that's what novelists do, right? You say, okay, these guys are out there blowing up oil rigs in the North Atlantic so that they can profit from the short on that, that oil company stock. But there are true hedge fund guys out there like Bill Ackman who are activist investors who take a position on a company and then 
try to manipulate the market or manipulate the media to drive a stock price in one direction or another. And I'm not asking you to call out Bill Ackman or to exonerate him, but like there are people that are purposefully trying to move markets based on their positions, uh, whether or not it's the right thing to do for the world. First of all, Ackman is a brilliant guy, been very successful. Uh, what you're describing is how do you profit from an investment? Once you've made an investment, you really do want to, to tell the world what you've done and why you've done it mm -hmm. and encourage other people to see it your way. I don't view that as manipulating markets. I view that as providing information to markets because then people can make their own decision whether they agree or disagree. But sort of getting the information out if you made an investment is a very important piece of the, uh, of the puzzle. But there's only a few people in the world on a relative basis anyway that can actually influence markets. If Paul Ollinger, diversified owner of mutual funds, tweets about a stock, nobody's going to give a damn. If somebody out there with the media machine, the PR machine can get the attention, they can actually move stock in one direction or another. Well, it's, I think that's true. And so much has changed in this world of social media. If you think about Reddit and the, you know, and GameStop and this wheat whale that, um, you know, I just mentioned the idea of, of driving up the price of, of wheat futures. If Paul Ollinger got on Reddit, uh, <laughs> And got on there in the right chat room and That's started right. telling the story. Maybe, Paul, maybe you've got a future in that. Paul Ollinger of Crazy Money Moves Markets. So when you first started writing your novel, if you just take a step back, you're like, okay, ex-hedge fund guy writes a novel. This guy's obviously a dilettante. How did you prove to people that you were serious? When I was uh, on Wall Street, I was at Morgan Stanley, and I made a great friend uh, who had been in the military and then came to the street to make some money, and he made some money, and he went back into the military and his name, you know, wasn't his Don. And he was the model for uh, Don Carter, who's, uh, you know, the protagonist in, in Under Money. So when I decided I wasn't going to write nonfiction. Can I say what Don ends up doing in the end? Can I say that? I won't say it. No spoilers here. You know, just to semi-spoil it, I'll just say that, you know, the real life Don wasn't happy with how Don ended up. You know, he was <laughs> Okay. He was reading along and I had a couple of readers who were military guys who were friends of mine. Don was one. And uh, he said, dude, dude, no, <laughs> can't do that to Don. But so I started out with a guy that was and is a real patriot and he became the colonel of the book. And I started building around that. But when I first started writing, I, it was just a complete amateur. I'd never written anything long form. But I would write a few chapters. I'd show them to my wife and to my kids. They're all great readers. And they said, yeah, keep going. So I kept going. You know, after about a year, I had a um, decent stab at a first draft of a novel. And this is where the, the miracle uh, came in. I was able to meet Sloan Harris, who is the co-head of literary at ICM, which is a top agency. The reason I was interested in Sloan, by the way, no reason why an ex-hedge fund guy with, you know, a couple of thousand words on a, on a page should be able to get an agent. That was crazy thinking, magical thinking. But I got an introduction to, to Sloan and he liked it. And he had been the agent for Jason Matthews, who you may have read the Red Sparrow trilogy. One was turned into a movie. Jason Matthews was an ex-CIA agent terrific storyteller. And, you know, I admire what he did. One of the, one of the models for, for under money and the style and concept behind it. And Sloan said, great. Okay. So now what we're going to do is you're going to rewrite the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just what you want to hear after putting a couple of years of your life into a project, right? Exactly. So I rewrote it under his guidance and, um, Fantastic guidance, wonderful man, a great reader and thinker and great experience in guiding writers. Uh, and he said, fine, we're going to take it to Colin Harrison, who is the editor-in-chief of Scribner's. And Colin happens to be the guy that bought the Jason Matthews series and edited uh, Jason Matthews. So magical thinking continues. Colin said, great, we'll buy it, but you're going to have to rewrite the whole book. Oh, <laughs> And the book got rewritten um, four times, including, and you, you know, just before you got on the call, Paul, you said, finish the book, but it was long. Well, after I submitted it to Scribner's, I had to still cut it by a third. So it was a lot worse. Um, it got <laughs> and, and streamlined and focused and made sharper. It was all, all good. Every, every revision was tremendously um, 
important to telling the story in a clean way. But you have a three-book deal, is that correct? Two more under negotiation, but being written. Yeah, I think that's my goal. I, I, you know, it's a great team and Scribner's is fantastic. And, you know, I want to keep working with them. So that's my intention. But is there a development deal in the works with one of the major studios? In conversation, yes. A few people are really interested. And so we're talking to them. And that's another entire universe that, again, under Sloan's guidance, I'm trying to figure out. But, you know, hedge fund guy goes to Hollywood. That's ridiculous. Just buy a studio. Come on. They're cheap these days. So the New Yorker calls the book, which again is called Under Money, it describes it thusly, espionage, financial intrigue, and geopolitics with a cynicism developed through years of observing politics and Wall Street titans up close. Are you a cynic? I'm a cynic. Yes, I am. I don't view that as a pejorative because I'm also an optimist. I think there are, you know, things we can all do that will improve, you know, our country and the state of the world. Every time someone uses the word Cynic, I think about, I said, Lily Tomlin, um, who had that f- fabulous adage, no matter how cynical I get, I just can't keep up. <laughs> that sounds like her. The more we all see about how the sausage is made uh, and in politics and finance and in business, it's just, um, it's hard not to be cynical. Maybe the, maybe the better word, as I would like to self-describe, is uh, realistic. Yeah, and speaking of that, Last night, as I'm finishing very close to the end of the book, there's a soliloquy that one of the characters talks about the way that Russia was treated by the United States after Glasnost. Just a reminder to everybody that you wrote this book, well, several times (laughs) uh, before the recent Russian invasion of Ukraine happened. But in this last chapter, there's a part where the character makes a very reasoned defense of why Russia is so paranoid about the U.S. and NATO. So... It's quite prescient, actually, and, and you know, given the recent events, how do you feel about the U.S. role and what could be going on in Russia and Ukraine, or, or what should we have done to prevent this kind of thing from happening? It's always a mistake not to listen to what people say, because even if there, you know, there's an element of spin to, and we all, we all have our own uh, orientations, we all have the story we want people to hear about ourselves. But Russia has been telling and Putin has been telling a consistent story for a long time. And if you look at Russian history, and by the way, I'm, not a, I'm in no sense excusing uh, at Russia's barbaric behavior. You do not apologize for or exonerate Vladimir Putin, to be quite clear. Impossible. But if you look at Russia's history, Russia has been invaded you know, so many times. And Russia was very clear uh, you know, after the wall fell that the physical geographic barriers that protected Russia, whether it was in the Baltics or in Eastern Europe or or in the South and the stands, that they were were fearful of their security. We might say, as we did say, you don't have to, you, Mr. Russia, don't have to worry about the West. We are not out to get you. We're not going to attack you. Just, you know, be calm. But, you know, then inch by inch, NATO was expanded. And that margin of safety, if you could call it that, was constricted. And all through that period, the Russian leaders were, were telling that story. They're saying, look, don't go there. Don't keep doing this. We're very concerned. We're a nuclear power. And do you, so you have to make a decision as a geopolitician whether you're going to be complacent and triumphal and ignore those statements or whether you're going to uh, you know, try to deal with them and heed them. And there was a time very early on when, you know, Russia and Russia was working quite well, the U.S. and the West were working quite well with Russia for a, a long period of time, including agreeing to the Nord Stream uh, 1 pipeline and agreeing to accept, you know, a huge amount of natural gas flowing into Europe, essentially putting the energy security of Europe in the hands of Russia. And that was something that you, you wouldn't do if you, if you didn't have a relationship that was, you know, founded in some sort of trust. But over time, either for local political reasons or because uh, he felt he was being ignored, Putin obviously took a different, you know, in, in a different direction. So I do put those words in the mouth of a guy who is actually uh, the real life guy is runs a private military company in Russia and uh, is, you know, quite passionate about that view. And I should also add that Vladimir Putin makes a cameo appearance in the book in a kind of a chilling and appropriate way. I can't, I can't believe reality cut off with fiction so quickly. It did indeed. It did indeed. 
I even had uh, Bill Browder on the as one of my early guests here. So you mentioned the Magnitsky Act, and I was like, I know what that is. <laughs> so last question, what advice would you give to someone who is making a mid or late career transition into a brand new craft? Keep at it. Keep at it, whether it's uh, music or art or writing. I think you have to uh, believe in your story and your ability to execute and just keep at it because it took, there are, there are many points, Paul, you mentioned uh, the idea that, you know, during my business career, I might've easily gotten discouraged and thrown up my hands and, and walked away. And I never felt quite that way, but there are many points in the writing process where I found it to be very, very difficult, especially when I was uh, told I had to go pretty much back to square one and rewrite. Uh, and even at the end, when, you know, I had all these, you know, magnificent words that I had to throw away. I didn't throw them away. <laughs> I them in a new file. But um, so I would say uh, if you're if you're in mid-career, late career, wherever you are, you're moving into something new, you really have to give it time and you really have to stick with it. And don't be afraid to kill your darlings when asked. <laughs> That's the job. <laughs> Well, Jay Newman, it's been a pleasure to talk to you a little bit. The book is called Under Money. Where can our listeners find out more about you and the book? JayNewman.com uh, is a great place. I post a lot there. Um, I'm on Twitter, wherever fine books are sold, uh, and all the online booksellers uh, you know, carry it. And I hope people will be interested in reading. We'll put links to that in the show notes. Jay, great to meet you. Thanks for your time. Paul, thank you for having me. Thank you, Jay, so much for the opportunity to talk to you. You guys might not really realize this, but Jay's a pretty big deal. Like, I mean, he's a legend in the hedge fund business. And those trades that he did with the sovereign debt were written about extensively in business publications for all those years. This was a crazy, crazy big deal that he did. My first takeaway is about the power of reinvention. Like, here's this guy who made hundreds of millions of dollars, presumably, as a hedge funder over the course of his 40-year career. And he has the humility and the long-term perspective to say, I'm going to try this new thing at which I have no earned credibility and very little skill because the skill is the kind of thing you build over years. And I'm going to think long-term and I'm going to put myself in the position of a novice and be willing to suck at something until I get good enough at it that I have something to share with the world. And here he is a few years later with a novel published by Scribner and a multi-book deal. Good for Jay Newman. I love this guy. Love the way he thinks long-term. Secondly, investing. It's good to know that I'm not the sucker at the table when I invest in uh, the uh, more meat and potato type stocks and bonds kind of thing and think long-term. That's a very different thing than trying to uh, take risks on flyers like collecting sovereign debt obligations this is not an investment show. This is not investment advice, but I think we'd all be happier and probably richer if we stuck to the things that we knew or the formulas that we know work. Don't chase the shiny objects. Lastly, I loved his distinction between the concepts of being a cynic and being an optimist. These are not mutually exclusive concepts, though I think a lot of people in the world would say so. Not everybody who thinks all flowery and positively is is uh, going to be happier than the people who have a slight degree of skepticism about the world. But that doesn't mean that those of us who are skeptics or cynics at times can't be optimistic about a reasonable outcome that looks a little bit like success and happiness. So that's it for this week. Thanks so much for staying to the end. I really appreciate Jay Newman's participation. Thanks a bunch. Until next time, Mike Carano, make me sound smart.